Is the Linux Foundation only about big business and big money these days? Is it no longer really about Linux? We're going to discuss that. Plus, the controversial online copyright law, Article 13, has been passed by the EU Parliament. Turn your smartphone or your Raspberry Pi into a laptop with the Next Doc 2, now live on Kickstarter. Sway is a tiling window manager specially crafted for the Wayland display server. Is it worth looking at? And a bit of GNOME news. There's a new extension that allows you to draw on your screen. Plus, the Gentoo devs now have GNOME 3.30 working without SystemD. These are five stories that I will be taking into account. And the first story on the docket tonight, is the Linux Foundation all about big business and big money these days? Are they no longer really about Linux? Uh, this comes from this blog here, techrights.org. Uh, this was written by Dr. Roy. The Linux Foundation is not about Linux. And in his summary here, I'll read briefly. The Linux Foundation objectives and missions do not resemble what the Open Source Development Labs was founded to accomplish. This puts at grave threat the raison d'etre of both GNU and Linux. So this particular article, of course, I'm not going to read the whole article, but it is a fascinating read. Actually, everything on this uh, blog, techrights.org, is a fascinating read. I will link to this particular blog post in the show description. But uh, in this particular article, he writes that the more that he writes and criticizes the Linux Foundation, the more feedback that he is receiving from other people who also are very critical of the Linux Foundation, people that have uh, worked with the Foundation and have have some misgivings about what the Linux Foundation has become these days. Obviously, the Linux Foundation, when I mention that it's all about big business and big money, a lot of the people that have high-ranking positions at the Linux Foundation. Uh, much of the board members of the Linux Foundation, they consist of people from major corporations, major corporations that donate large sums of money to the Linux Foundation. So you're talking about people from Google, Facebook, IBM, Microsoft, Oracle. Uh, and most of those companies, I wouldn't say, are champions of free software or open source software or in some cases don't really champion Linux <laughs> as far and maybe Google I give Google and IBM some credit Microsoft eh, they're you know, kind of changing their ways Facebook I mean these are the people that are running the Linux Foundation the author mentions that one of the people that it, I guess have reached out to him and gave him some feedback about the Linux Foundation was a fellow named uh, Ken Starks I guess he's been actively trying to get a GNU slash Linux uh, in the hands of children in need, maybe in developing countries. I'm not exactly sure, but he's been critical of the Linux Foundation and some of the work it does. And he, he mentions that people are afraid in many cases to criticize the Linux Foundation because of the name, the Linux Foundation, fearing that if you criticize something called the Linux Foundation, you're going to be framed as anti-Linux. Uh, which isn't the case at all. These people love GNU slash Linux. It's just they don't like what the Linux Foundation has become. Or you may be labeled anti-Linus Torvalds, who is not even really the boss at the Linux Foundation. He is paid by the Linux Foundation, but he doesn't run the Linux Foundation. The Linux Foundation is run by a fellow named Jim Zemlin. And Zemlin, even though I guess he's the head of the, the Linux Foundation, he's not really the boss. The boss is the board, uh, the, I guess the uh, board members of the Linux Foundation who technically can fire Zemlin and appoint somebody else in his place if they get fed up with him. So the, it's all about the board members and the leverage comes from the very top at that board, which now includes the likes of, you know, people like uh, from Microsoft, for example. Microsoft has a seat on that board. The article goes on to quote somebody that worked with a charity program called Kids on Computers. Quote, Kids on Computers set up Pi and maintain many labs in Mexico. None of the funding for travel, food, expenses, or equipment was procured through support by the Linux Foundation from what I was told and what I saw. In fact, Kids on Computers is suffering financially, last I knew. So I, I guess this particular charity organization was expecting some kind of help from the Linux Foundation and they haven't received any funding. And that particular charity to get GNU slash Linux in the hands of kids struggling financially. 
Now, the Linux Foundation, how it was originally founded, is basically intended to pay Linus Torvald's salary and various other people that work on the Linux kernel. So that is what that is. It's to maintain the Linux kernel. It's to pay Linus Torvalds, who heads kernel development, and hey, here's your money, here's your salary every year. Maintain the kernel, maintain standards with the kernel. It's to keep the kernel going because so many companies depend on Linux now. Companies, the big major companies like Google and Microsoft and Facebook, you know, they all run Linux. They run Linux servers. Google has several operating systems like Android and Chrome OS that depend on the Linux kernel. So they pay a large amount of money to the Linux Foundation who in turn pays Linus Torvalds and various other employees that work for Linus to maintain the kernel. Now, exactly how much money is donated to the Linux Foundation every year, we're not really sure. Uh, I guess the last uh, bit of information that was reported to the IRS was back in 2016. Uh, the figure, I'm sure, has gone up by now. The author here estimates that it's probably over $100 million in annual revenue going to the Linux Foundation. Uh, that's a massive amount of money going toward kernel development. The author goes on to mention that people that are critical of the Linux Foundation and the head of the Linux Foundation, in particular Jim Zimlin, uh, Jim Zimlin famously has blocked a lot of people that criticize him on Twitter. Brian Lunduke has been critical of Jim Zimlin uh, many times on his YouTube channel, Brian Lunduke. If you guys are not subscribed to the Lunduke channel, you should check it out. But he has criticized Jim Zimlin and the Linux Foundation, but he criticized Jim Zimlin famously on a video a while back because Jim Zimlin is a Mac user. He goes and gives a presentation at some Linux conference one time, and he did it on a MacBook <laughs> using the Mac OS. And Brian Lunduke is very critical that somebody like that heads the Linux Foundation. I, too, <laughs> share that same concern. And I guess Jim Zimlin just blocks people that criticize him on Twitter. And the author here goes, does the Linux Foundation respect free speech at all? Well, for one thing, uh, Twitter <laughs> is not public. I mean, anybody can block anybody on Twitter, so that's not really a free speech is issue, but I can see where you're going with that. He mentions that also with the free speech issue, the fact that the Linux kernel team has uh, adopted that code of conduct, that very controversial code of conduct from a few months back. Many people see that as a way to, I guess, stifle free speech. I don't see it that way. The Linux kernel team has a right to adopt any code of conduct they wish. I mean, this is their house, their rules. When they come to my house, they have to abide by my rules. If you want to play with the Linux kernel team, you have to play by their rules. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm not as harsh or critical about the Linux Foundation or the Linux kernel team about things like the code of conduct. But I, I can see why some people kind of lump all of this together. You know, it's a pattern, right? And what I mean by a pattern is that code of conduct, that uh, covenant, the uh, contributor covenant code of conduct has been adopted by thousands, tens of thousands of companies and organizations. Uh, many of them are affiliated with some of the folks that are contributing money to the Linux Foundation. Companies like Google and Facebook and Microsoft. So if they use that kind of code of conduct, it's understandable why how that code of conduct has made its way into the Linux kernel, for example. And in closing here in this article, the author is also critical about the Linux Foundation's attitude towards the GPL and with VMware. I guess VMware uh, contributes money, of course, to the Linux Foundation, very large company. VMware, much of their stuff is not open source. Some of it is. Some of their stuff is licensed with the GPL. But in the past, VMware has not been good about releasing their GPL code, which is a big no-no. Uh, but I guess the Linux Foundation, as long as you're paying them money, I guess they're not going to be too critical of you. And the second story on the docket tonight is about the controversial online copyright law that was just passed by the EU Parliament. This story comes from False Bytes. So this controversial online copyright law that was just passed, we knew it was coming. Uh, this was just passed yesterday, which was uh, Monday, March 27, 2019, the European Parliament passed 
uh, the EU copyright law, and namely, it, it contains two clauses that really have the internet kind of in an uproar. Those are Article 11 and Article 13. Let's start with Article 13. Article 13 will enforce strict copyright measures over really everybody, but in particular, social media companies, uh, YouTube, Facebook, Google, Twitter, Reddit, things like that. These gigantic tech sites rely heavily on really almost exclusively on user-generated content for their platform. So, of course, YouTube is nothing but user-generated content. It is user-generated videos. That's all that is on YouTube. Uh, Facebook, same thing. It's user-generated text and or video. Same thing with much of the other Google properties, uh, Twitter, Reddit, and you name the gigantic social platform on the Internet. It is all user-generated content. Now with Article 13, Article 13 basically wants to implement these really strict copyright rules over what is considered original work and for any small or independent artists. So Article 13, not too many people are in favor of Article 13. If you ask just anybody about it on the internet, nobody was really in favor of this thing except for the big record companies and the film industry who are always for these <laughs> these kinds of things because it prevents any of their original work from being used without their per permission well you're like well nobody could really use their work without their permission before i mean there's already laws on the books you know everywhere about this sort of stuff yeah there is but article 13 takes things a step for further no longer can an independent artist such as myself on social media make parodies reviews memes out of the content that these record companies or these uh, film companies I, I can't make a parody video about some movie I saw or a parody video about some song or I, I can't even review like uh, uh, the latest you know hit so song or anything like that on video anymore I can't make a meme out of anything Moving on to Article 11, Article 11 may be even worse than Article 13. Uh, now, any content you put on the internet essentially has to be new content. It cannot represent creative property theft. And again, you're like, well, there's already laws on the books about this sort of thing. Well, what they're talking about here is uh, the curation of news on the internet without the permission of the publisher. Like this, like this show I'm doing today, I'm going to link to a bunch of news articles that I talked about. Uh, is it is that okay? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not exactly sure how these new rules are going to affect things like videos about news or about other news like blogs uh, talking about recent news stories. This is. I don't know where we go with this, and I'm not sure if some of these websites, things like YouTube, for example, that I'm on today, Facebook, Twitter, I'm not sure how they are going to survive with these new rules. Um, because no one is, I, I would no longer be able to do taking into account every week. If I have to go get permission from the people that publish the articles that I discuss on the show, uh, and that's basically what Article 11 is stipulating it leaves uh basically it according to the article here let me read this supporters of this article argued that google in particular incentivizes clickbait articles and thus leaves no room for the proper old school investigating jur journalism so they're blaming a lot of the crap the clickbaity articles and the clickbaity videos and everything you see on the internet as the reason the article 11 is needed because those clickbaity kind of articles they, uh, I guess, deter from people doing proper old school investigative journalism. Uh, I think that is a stretch. So who exactly is going to go and ask for permission from these people to, you know, use the, their uh, news articles or whatever? Who And if, if they require payment, who pays them? I guess essentially Google would have to pay the news site before it could share news on the Google platform. And same thing with Facebook, same thing with Twitter. Uh so I'm not exactly sure. Like I said, the new law just passed yesterday. We'll see how this affects us going forward. I'm, I'm kind of curious. I already uh, got an announcement the other day uh, I, when I logged into YouTube about the, the passage of Article 13. I'm not exactly sure what the new rules, how this is going to affect people like me, content creators like me. 
And the third story on the docket tonight is the next dock 2. Now you can turn your Android phone or your Raspberry Pi or your tablet, well, you know, small form factor devices. Now you can turn them into a laptop with the next dock 2. Now, I thought this was a really neat piece of tech. And it's a Kickstarter program, so and I will actually show you the Kickstarter page here for the next doc too. But I'm going to check out the article here about it at OMG Ubuntu. So the next doc too basically is a laptop. This is a laptop. You see, you guys that are watching the video here, it is essentially a laptop. It doesn't have an operating system or anything. It is basically a laptop shell, right? It's got a keyboard and of course the display. But what actually is the operating system? Well, it is whatever device you plug into this. So we're talking smartphones, tablets, Raspberry Pis, uh, I'm sure other small like single board computing devices similar to a Pi would probably work as well. So this is a really, really neat concept. Apparently they've already done this once before. That's why this is the next dock too, rather than just the next dock. I guess they uh, had a previous project called the next dock that was also a Kickstarter campaign and it was successful and they actually shipped devices. The next dock, the original one, was a 14.1 inch laptop shell, no computer inside. And they successful, successfully crowdfunded that back in 2016. The next dock 2 is 13.3 inch display. It's a laptop shell that turns smartphones and small form PCs into full fledged computers. Uh, what exactly does it have? What doesn't it have? Obviously, as you can see, it has a keyboard and the display. Does not have a CPU. Does not have RAM. Obviously, no graphics card or anything like that. Does have speakers, built-in speakers, so you can get audio. It does have a trackpad as well. Other than that, everything else, whatever the device you plug in, that is the actual hardware. And the neat thing now that mobile devices in particular are becoming more and more powerful, that's why this kind of makes sense. And also, the really neat thing about this just being a laptop shell rather than actually having physical hardware inside it, CPU and RAM and graphics cards and everything, you know, those things get old and obsolete rather quick. In a few years, uh, if this was a beefy kind of machine, it will be mediocre at best in about five years. But because this is just a shell and it powers whatever device you plug into, uh, you're always going potentially could be running the latest and greatest hardware. Well, when your phone contract runs out in a year and you get the newest you know, iPhone or the newest Samsung, whatever, uh, just plug that sucker into the laptop shell here and you have successfully upgraded that machine. So anything that can be connected to an HDMI port will in theory work on the next dock too. So that's why the Raspberry Pi is a, a neat little, uh, form factor to plug into this thing. I own a Raspberry Pi myself. I actually wouldn't mind uh, funding this and maybe receiving one of these. The price is also pretty reasonable. By the way, the Kickstarter campaign, they have a goal of $50,000. Early bird pricing of which is $179 scores you one of these next dock units. And that is incredible. <laughs> so that's the early bird pricing, uh, later pricing. I think you probably need to add about a hundred dollars to that, probably, you know, closer to $300 for, for the laptop shell. Uh, but those of you that want to contribute early and I may actually do this. So the, I will link of course, to the OMG article about next doc two. And of course the Kickstarter campaign, the Kickstarter campaign by the uh, page here goes into great detail about the next doc two. some fantastic, uh, pictures. They also have a really cool video that shows you the device in action. And the fourth story on the docket tonight is about a tiling window manager. You guys know I cover a lot of tiling window managers on my YouTube channel. I don't think I've ever really done a story about a tiling window manager on the Taking Into Account series though. And the reason I wanted to cover this one is Sway. Sway is a tiling window manager that was built especially for using with Wayland, the Wayland display server. So for those of you that want to use Wayland rather than X11, here's a window manager that will work just fine for you. So this article comes from It's False. Sway. Sway is basically an i3 clone. It is almost exactly like i3 in every way. It's just, you know, i3 rewritten to run 
on Wayland. Now, Sway just recently had their 1.0 release, so their official 1.0 release. Sway has been around and, and kind of popular for the last couple of years, but it was always seen as kind of beta software. Now they have officially released what they're calling 1.0. Now, what is a tiling window manager? For those of you that are brand new to my uh, YouTube channel here, or you're not familiar with what a tiling window manager is, is it's a window manager that places windows on your screen in a tiling fashion so none of them ever overlap. Uh, this is completely different than most other window managers you're used to using because those are floating window managers where the windows you can float them on top of each other. So a tiling window manager is really neat. Tiling window managers are usually keyboard driven, almost exclu exclusively keyboard driven. So uh, the mouse is not really needed at all in a tiling window manager, although you can use the mouse to do some functions if you so choose. According to the project website, Sway is um, basically it's a drop-in replacement. They call it a drop-in replacement for the i3 window manager. So it's basically i3 for Wayland. So Sway supports all the i3 settings and key bindings. It's designed to work on both Linux and FreeBSD. And if you're moving to Sway from i3, there's a wiki page that will help you make that transition. So the 1.0 release looks like that to get to this point, it took over 9,000 commits and 100,000 lines of code. Wow, that is definitely not a suckless project. <laughs> According to the release notes, Sway is 100% compatible with i3, i3 gaps, i3 bar, etc. There were a few features that i3 has that did not make it into Sway. Uh, things like the layout, save, and restore feature that i3 has because that only really makes sense on X11 systems. There's no way to do it on Wayland. Now, the reason I wanted to mention this story today is because people keep asking me, because I try out all these tiling window managers, different tiling window managers, things like DWM and Herbs Lift WM and Xmonad and Qtile, i3. Uh, people keep asking me, when are you going to take a look at Sway? I, I have people beg me, you know, man, you got to take a look at Sway. I'm using it and I love it. Will you please show Sway on the channel? I use an NVIDIA card and NVIDIA to do like these videos to record an OBS to make my weekly taking into account show for example I use the proprietary video drivers on my NVIDIA card the proprietary video drivers NVIDIA drivers do not work with Wayland <laughs> so there's no point in me taking a look at Sway which uses Wayland if I can't use Wayland, I can't use Wayland and use my video card with the drivers I want to use and have to use. I have to use the NVIDIA proprietary drivers to do my YouTube channel. So no, I can't take a look at Sway. I mean, I could, I'd have to, but it wouldn't be a good look. Uh, I would probably have to take a look at it maybe in a VM. I couldn't live in Sway. Like when I check out things like Xmonad and Herbs Luft and all these other tiling window managers, you guys know I switch to them and live in them for a month you know a few weeks I can't I, there's no way I could live in Sway it's just not possible not with the work I have to do so that is why I haven't done anything with Sway on the channel yet maybe I will at some point but Waylon has to get to the point that is usable at least for somebody like me an Nvidia user and right now it's just not to that point and the fifth and final story on the docket tonight is uh, really two different stories. I combine them into one story because I don't give GNOME a lot of love on the channel. I'm not a GNOME user. You guys know I don't like big, bloated, heavy desktop environments like GNOME. And GNOME is big, bloated, heavy. But I thought these uh, next two stories were kind of interesting, so I wanted to share them. So from OMG Ubuntu again, uh, draw on your screen with this neat GNOME shell extension. So there is a new GNOME shell extension that lets you draw on your screen. And there is a really neat screenshot. I guess uh, Joey, the author here, you know, he drew these words, everything you see on the screen and the, the pink underline and the pink pink dots here where he circled something on the screen. That's really, really kind of cool. Uh, I could actually see a use for this. This isn't just something to be kind of cutesy with, although it could be a fun little thing to play with too. But I, I could see, you know, why you might want to, before you take a screenshot of something, circle something on the screen, you know, for, for the kind of work I do if I was a GNOME user, I would actually find such an extension 
kind of useful. So the available tools for this particular extension includes shapes. You can draw things like rectangles, circles, etc., lines. So you can draw a straight line, a freehand drawing, of course, and then uh, adding text. Uh, and you have a variety of colors to choose from. So first thing, you have to be running GNOME Shell 3.26 or later. The extension will not work on the older versions of the GNOME Shell. If you're using Ubuntu 18.04 LTS or later, you're good to go. If you're using a previous version of Ubuntu, something prior to 1804, you're probably not good to go. So assuming you have the relevant parts needed to install the GNOME extension on Ubuntu, and he's talking about Ubuntu specifically here at OMG Ubuntu, uh, all you need to do is head to the extensions page below, and he links to where you can go grab the extension in the article. You just go to that page. Uh, on the, that page, there will be an install button. You just click on it, and you got the extension. Away you go. The other bit of GNOME news I wanted to share because I wanted to give a shout out to people that do really good work and the Gen 2 devs. So this was posted just yesterday. GNOME.3 well, GNOME is now available in the Gen 2 Linux testing branch. So starting with this release, GNOME on Gen 2 once again works with OpenRC. OpenRC is the init system that Gentoo uses. They do not use SystemD. They've been on OpenRC forever. They have no plans ever to move off of OpenRC. They probably would never move to SystemD uh, <laughs> for ideological reasons, but the GNOME devs, for some reason, GNOME has some pretty hard dependencies. One of them is SystemD. You have to be on a machine that uses systemd as the init system to run some of these later versions of GNOME. And some of the recent versions of GNOME are broken on Gen 2 because they have that systemd dependency. You can't get it installed and working without systemd. Well, the Gen 2 devs have hacked on this thing. They achieved uh, this basically through the eLoginD project, which is a standalone LoginD implementation based on systemd code. It's currently maintained by one of the Gentoo users. Uh, Gentoo would like to thank Mart and Gavin for the work and all the others that worked on this. So anyway, I thought this was really neat because they managed to, you know, th those few system D requirements that were preventing GNOME 3.30, they were able to basically get this thing working. They were able to implement some uh, replacements for the things that they needed. So big shout out to the Gentoo devs. Great work. And that was the fifth and final story on the docket tonight. This was Taking Into Account episode 35. I try to release a new episode of Taking Into Account every Thursday, sometime every Thursday. So look for Taking Into Account episode 36 sometime next Thursday. As always, I like to end these shows by reading a viewer question or com comment that I get from uh, email or over on Mastodon. If you're not following me on Mastodon, you really should. Mastodon has become my social media platform of choice. Uh, today's question, though, comes from a variety of people on a variety of platforms. Mastodon, uh, the YouTube comments. I did a video uh, a few days ago about a really neat terminal-based internet radio client called Curse Radio, and it is a Python app, and I didn't have much trouble installing it because I use a Arch-based distro, and Curse Radio is in the AUR. I just installed it in the AUR. But if you're on pretty much any other distro, you have to install this thing. You have to go grab the source from GitHub and actually install it. Uh, it's not hard, though. It's a, a Python application. There are some dependencies. So I had some of you guys who uh, tried to install it and run through the setup, and it was you, you were getting error messages in your terminal output. Uh, I can tell you some of the stuff you're probably missing. If you're missing a dependency, I bet you're probably missing that one. LXML might not be on your system. Uh, and depending on what distro you are, that dependency could be called different things depending on the distro. On Arch-based systems, that particular dependency, that program is python-lxml. You need to install that to satisfy that dependency. Also, MPV needs to be installed on your system. Um, that should be pretty obvious if it's not. Anyway, for those of you that are not familiar with how to install something that's not in your package manager, so you, you get this, uh, go to the clone or download link here, and you download the zip file. Download the zip file, extract it, and then there's a file here called setup.py. That's the file that you need to run 
that should install this thing. If you don't have all the dependencies, though, it tells you here at the GitHub page uh, the dependencies. If you don't have the GitHub uh, the dependencies squared away, though, you're going to get some error messages. It's going to complain to you. But if you read the terminal output, it will tell you what dependencies you're missing. You need to go get them. And before I go, this show was made possible by Ansem, Carlos, Chris, Douglas, Dylan, Leo, Rob, Robert, and Tony. They are the producers of the show. Without them, episode 35 of Taking Into Account would not have been possible today. This show was also brought to you by all those fine ladies and gentlemen, all those names that you see on the screen, that growing list of names that really help contribute and support my work over on Patreon. Without them, again, this show would not be possible. I want to give a sincere thank you to each and every one of you guys. If you would like to support the channel, please do so. You'll find me at DistroTube over on Patreon. All right, guys. Peace.